Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies, on this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, do you get me again, Dr. Janine Krauss? And on this episode, I'm going to speak on peptides because I've been kind of quiet during this whole explosion of GLP-1s, otherwise known as semaglutide, terzepatide, so ZEP-bound, Ozempic, and Manjaro. Here's the thing. I've been working with peptides for over a decade, and they showed up in my my world because I, I lift a lot of weights. I love weightlifting. And weightlifters... OG weightlifters are folks who are always tweaking their body. They're like the original biohackers. And weightlifters are going to try to get the edge, right? If they're going into a competition, like say it's a fitness competition where you get to wear the bikinis and you look really cute on stage and you get yourself nice and thin and you got to do shreds and all these kind of things. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes you need a little leg up. And this is where peptides have always come in. And also come in for when you have issues with sprains, strains, things of that nature. So I've been familiar with peptides for a very long time. And I knew the side effects in terms of needing to have enough protein, needing to make sure that you're working out. So in my mind, I always kind of thought about peptides as being something for someone who's trying to get their leg up on something and, and you know, who had a pretty healthy background in the first place. Because here's the thing. Peptides, like supplements, like anything, you can't just give them to somebody and expect miracles. Now, are people losing weight on Ozempic and Terzepatide and Zepbound? Manjaro, the pharmaceutical names of things? Absolutely. Do they work? Well, yes. If you're taking care of yourself, if you're following a high protein diet, if you're working out, if you're doing the right things, because I've seen plenty of people try them, just get sick and not be getting any progress. So that being said, there's a lot of docs out there who are on the peptide bandwagon now and they're talking about on their peptide or on their podcasts and things of that nature. And they've created classes and all these different things for helping support people on taking peptides, which I think is amazing. That's great. And we need this. Here's my, here's, here's the thing that worries me. The peptides market, now, the FDA and the pharmaceuticals have the semaglutide nailed down as Ozempic and the terzepatide as Zepbound and Manjaro. We can still get semaglutide and terzepatide from compounding pharmacies that are known as 503Bs, which are large scale compounding pharmacies. We used to be able to get compounds like this peptides from a compounding pharmacy locally. FDA shut that down. I love a peptide called BPC-157. Sounds like a German U-boat, but what it is is body protective complex. That's what BPC stands for. And it's amazing for helping tendons and ligaments and muscle sprains, strains, things of that nature. It speeds healing up. I found it to be more useful in a lot of cases in my practice back when I was using platelet-rich plasma injections. So PRP, if you've heard of that super expensive stuff. And I'm always looking for something that's going to be more cost effective and get good results. BPC-157 is that. Combined with something called TB-500. What is this? It all sounds probably like so in the future numbers and letters and things. But TB-500 is thymosin beta-4. It's it's an incredibly helpful peptide that when paired with BPC-157 can really speed up healing of tendons, ligaments, muscles, sprains, and strains. Now, I've also found BPC-157 on its own to be helpful for the gut, and I've found that TB-500 on its own is helpful for thyroid conditions, helpful for boosting energy, and also for the immune system. But they're expensive. They they cost more than a regular supplement. However, they are more powerful. You have to inject them subcutaneously. So this is when you're picking up your skin and you're going just right into that tissue above your muscle. That's subcutaneous. It's totally doable if you're up for injections. 
Not everybody's up for that kind of thing. Now, I kind of kick myself in the rear for not saying much about peptides all this time because a lot of people are in my practice have been like, oh, I found this doc who does peptides. I'm like, I guess I should have told you that I know a lot about peptides. I just, with the FDA shutting down the BPC and from compounding pharmacies, really my resource for BPC and for TB500, things of that nature, in addition to semaglutide and terzepatide, my resources are websites that say flat out on them, these materials are for research purposes only, which basically means I'm recommending patients to go to these websites to research on their body to see if these particular peptides work, which it's a conundrum as a doc, because if something happens to someone, it's on me. And if all of a sudden the FDA decides that these compounding pharmacies, these 503Bs, the large compounding pharmacies that you can get the GLP-1 peptides from, they decide, nope, you can't do that anymore. You have to go pharmaceutical route only. This is expensive. Not that the compounding pharmacies aren't expensive in the first place to use for, for peptides. Because on average, if your insurance does not cover peptides, you're looking at over $1,000 a month and in some cases $2,000. And if your insurance doesn't cover a peptide and you want to pay cash for it, I would look to a compounding pharmacy, a doctor who knows about a 503B compounding pharmacy so that they can prescribe it for you through that way and you pay cash. It's going to be a little less and it's going to vary depending on your dosage. So here's where we get into the nitty gritty about peptides. There are varying dosages depending on what you're dealing with. Now, are there standardized dosages? Yes. Same thing with Ozempic, same thing with Manjaro and, and Zepbound. There are standardized dosages. If you're needing to lose a lot of weight on a GLP-1, you're going to have to slowly work up and get to a higher dosage till you get to your ideal weight. Then I usually would back people back down. Now, keep in mind, everything I'm going to say here, it is my, it's my protocols how I do things. Peptides are a new frontier in medicine. And there is no one size fits all. Despite what the FDA will tell you, they have their dosages. That's how they do it. That's how it says to do it. That's a recommended dosing. But you can microdose semaglutide. You can microdose terzepatide at low dosages to prevent side effects of the gut. Because GLP-1 slow down your digestive system. They can cause nausea. They can cause vomiting. They can have you feeling pretty dang sick. And so if you have constipation, this is something you want to be thinking about if you before you use one of these things to lose weight, because it is going to slow down your digestive system. It's going to have you feeling full for longer. One of the miracle side effects that people um, mention is, is it reduces food noise because you're not hungry. Yeah, because it's taking longer for your digestive system to break down your food. However, if it's slowing down your gut, now we got problems, right? And if it's slowing it down so far, we've got to work to, to counteract that. Have I worked with folks to counteract that? Absolutely. You can hack all these things. The reason I am putting out this podcast right now is because I know that a lot of people are going to go underground to the research websites to find terzepatide, to find semaglutide when either their insurance stops covering their prescription or when they really are desperate enough to get some solutions with weight loss. And I know a lot of women in the perimenopause, menopause space get desperate to lose weight. I'd be lying if I haven't been there. Sometimes when that scale's not moving and you're like, I am doing all the things. I'm doing all the things. Why is it not, why is it not working? Here's the thing. We have a reason for why the body's not shedding the weight. Nervous system's one of them. Mindset's not right. Nervous system's got to hold on to things. That is a big deal. But the other big thing I mentioned about was fatty, metabolic fatty liver conditions. This is a real deal situation. Our guts and our microbiomes can get really backed up. And all the like gut repair protocols and microbiome balancing protocols and all that stuff might not work if your nervous system is too fried. Now, how is going to giving yourself an injection going to be a solution? Well, here's the thing. If your nervous system can tolerate an injection versus all the supplements, 
hey, why not? And we found through research that terzepatide in particular has an amazing ability to help on the gut microbiome. I've also seen it help in neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, things of that nature. Why? Because maybe the Alzheimer's and Parkinson and the neurodegenerative conditions are actually from a microbiome and backed up liver situation. Something to think about. Our livers are in charge of all of our detox. If you can't detox well and your gut's backed up, which anyone who's eating standard American diet processed food, dyes, all the preservatives, your gut's backed up. There's no way around it. Your gut's backed up. And likely you have a microbiome imbalance. So this is why these injectables work well, these GLP-1s. And in particular, trisepatide is my favorite. I do prefer it over semaglutide, but the price is more. And sometimes I'll, we'll try semaglutide first and see how it goes and then move into trisepatide. Now, where it gets tricky is finding your microdose and your sweet spot. I always start everyone out on the base dosages for the, these peptides. And then we stick with that for a month, see how things go. In my world, you have to be eating protein. You have to be eating at least one gram per body, pound of body weight and your ideal body weight. Because if you weigh 300 pounds, eating 300 grams of protein a day is ridiculous. And if you're going to inject and then slow down your gut, that's a recipe for disaster. So we want to be thinking about ideal body weight dosing. You have to be working out in some capacity, whether it's weightlifting, whether it is some kind of fitness. I do, because of my background, really gravitate towards weightlifting on this one because muscles, protein, helping your metabolism. The more you have muscle, the more mitochondria you have to burn fat and to help the situation out here. So if you're not keen on weightlifting, we got to think of a way for body weight stuff, Pilates, something of that nature where you're, you're stressing your body a little bit. Keep in mind, yes, my background is weightlifting and, and that kind of department for this. And that's where I've seen it work really well when we're trying to get folks down to the nitty gritty, let's say, when we're looking at fitness competitions. So when you're looking at peptides, you want to be thinking like, okay, where in my body do I need some support? Because there are a lot of peptides out there. There are ones that can help you with sleep. There's ones that can help you with boosting growth hormone as well. So something called DSIP, Delta Sleep Inducing Peptides. So Delta Waves, pretty cool. That one I've seen help a lot of folks, especially if you've got some folks that are starting to do some odd patterns with sleep. So sundowning, things of that nature. Interesting support there. Now, other things are looking at what's going on in the space of growth hormone. A lot of people are injecting growth hormone, and I don't know. Um, that can be a little risky in some cases. Some people, it, it is beneficial if you do have a low growth hormone production, growth hormone production in your body. How do you know? Well, you can test IGF one, which is a precursor to the or, or a marker for finding if you're low on growth hormone. And if it is low, then yeah, a little growth hormone for a little bit may not bother you. Now, keeping in mind that when you're injecting anything hormonally, you are messaging with or messing with the signaling back up to your brain. And, and so even with bioidentical hormones, we have to think about that because we're going to be messing with the signal back up to the brain as to what to release when. So this is why I like peptides better than straight growth hormone. It's a little trickier to use the straight growth hormone. I like to use something called CJC-1295 slash ipamorelin. What the heck is that? It is a growth hormone booster. It helps with sleep as well. It's injected commonly at night to help just folks make a little more growth hormone over time. It's kind of considered an anti-aging support peptide. Now, there are other types of peptides out there that can help in that department. There are other types of peptides like AOD64 that help with blood sugar balance, much like 
the terzepatides and semaglutides. And some people have done really well with AOD64. Now, you might be thinking like, God, there's all these like letters and numbers. Like what, where does this come from? This is from research. These aren't just like plucked out of nowhere. Vladimir Kavinson in Russia was researching a lot with athletes on peptides back in the 80s. Like I would dare to say that he's probably like the grandfather, if you will, of peptides. There's also a fella in Canada, John, uh, John Francois Tremblay, there's his name. He has something called CanLab where he's doing research on peptides. And there's a lot of great things coming out about peptides. Now, it's funny. I've been talking peptides, peptides. What if you don't even know what a peptide is? I better tell you. So peptides are small protein fragments that your body makes for signaling for all kinds of different messages in the body. It could be healing. It could be telling the body to do something. It could tell the body to go into delta sleep wave patterns. It's a messaging system. That's what these little protein fragments are all about. And as we get older, we decrease on the production of peptides. Probably because a lot of people just don't eat as much protein as they used to, which is why I do think it is useful to have protein. It's like one of my number one things as we get older. And yes, I know it's a struggle to get in protein. I myself have to really kind of think about it to get it in. So where do I stand on peptides when I've had people on my podcast that are like, oh, heck no, no way, no peptides, no how? Well, the gal who's on my peptide or who talked about the pot. I can talk. The gal who was on my podcast that talked about peptides was talking about Ozempics and, and things of that nature being used in a nursing home setting where folks are not working out, where they're not lifting weights, which, yeah, that could be kind of negative. But here's the thing. If you're already in a nursing home, unless you have a very strong drive to get out of there, I don't know if it really matters. For all of us folks that are not in nursing homes here, that's where I'm at. I'm trying to keep people out of nursing homes, assisted living, on your own, independent, as long as you possibly can or for life. I mean, my goal, I used to say I want to live to 150. At this point, I'm like, I just want to live long with my brain intact and be able to stay in my home. I don't have kids. I don't have anybody to take care of me. Maybe some of you out there are like that. Or maybe you have kids and you're like, yeah, they're not going to take care of me. Whatever it may be, the point is, is... I do think peptides can help us with the aging process. It's kind of like a little boost. And the cool thing about peptides is we do not have to inject ourselves every day for the rest of our life. You can cycle these things. The BPC-157 and, and TB-500, I cycle on 20-day cycles. 20 days on, take a month off or take two weeks off. It depends. It depends on your, your progress, right? If you feel better, and you're like, yeah, I, my shoulder was tweaky and now it's good. Good. Take a month off. Do another month on, you know, or 20 days, I'm sorry, on. And go cycle back and forth. I've used BPC on my, my own with my hip, my back, you know, different, different conditions over the years. And yeah, you cycle on, you cycle off. And if you feel good and you feel like, yeah, I got that one nipped in the bud. Okay, great. If something else tweaks, then work on that. So... In a perfect world, if you're trying to prevent aches and pains and you're trying to give your tendons, ligaments, et cetera, support, you could take BPC-157 and TB-500 like three times a year. You could do, do cycles quarterly, you know, take three of the quarters out of the year. However you want to do it. The thing is, is there's no right way. There's no necessarily wrong way. If you use too much of a peptide, you're just wasting money. That's what happens. And if you use too much, okay. Let me back up. If you use too much of a GLP-1, you're going to be sick. But if you use too much of like BPC-157 or TB-500, you're just wasting it is what's happening. And nobody wants to do that because they are not exactly cheap, but they're not exactly super expensive when it comes down to could these keep you from having to take chondritin, glucosamine, curcumin, you know, boswellia, frankincense, like all the things we think about for anti-inflammatories, could these cut that supplement cost out. If they can, that's how I roll. Well, that's a score, right? Now you don't have to pay for that. So I think we can offset these and think about them in that respect. I also think if we do end up going into another 
how do I want to say this? Um, if there's another virus that shows up on the scene, TB500 can be very effective. So thymus and beta-4 can be very effective to keep that around. Just saying. Now, okay, dosing for semaglutides and terzepatides, these are things where you want to start low and you can ramp up. And I have people when they get to their like ideal weight, sometimes what they'll do is they'll back back down on the dose and microdose. You can keep the dosing low on both of them and just ride that out. I accidentally, when working with a patient and trying to figure out, so he here's a here's a side story. Because if you're not, if you're not gonna get a peptide from a compounding pharmacy, because what's going to happen with the compounding pharmacy is they're going to reconstitute it. They're going to put bacteriostatic water in there so that there's liquid in there. If they, you're not getting your peptide from there and you're getting it from a website that is a research only, so you're doing research on your body, wink, wink. Um, if you're doing that, you have to reconstitute the peptide on your own because it comes in a vial in a powder. We've had some mishaps over the years in terms of how much bacteriostatic water goes into the vials. Reason being is because I wasn't aware of which milliliter vial the person had, right? Because we're communicating over Zoom. It's hard to see unless they bring it into me in person, then I can see it. I can go, okay, you've got a two mil vial or a five mil vial and mil means milliliters. And so you have to be aware that on those bottles, it may say five milligram dose of terzepatide. And when it says that on the label, that means five milligrams in the bottle. Okay. So if you put in one milliliter of water, that's five milligrams that is in one milliliter. You're not going to dose five milligrams of terzepatide to start off with. A lot of people were going even lower than the minimum 2.5 milligram dosing. But that being said, you have to think about how much of the bacteriostatic water you are putting into that vial. Otherwise, if you put in, say, two milliliters to cover that whole vial, you're diluting your solution there. So let me back up just so, so it's clear. Each of these vials have the dose of what's in it. Doesn't matter if it's a five mil bottle or a one mil, two mil bottle. If it says five milligrams on it, that's the amount of powder that's in there. To make it easier on yourself, usually I just will add one and at the most two milliliters of fluid to that vial to make it easier on you. So if the lowest dosage of terzepatide is 2.5 milligrams, and you have a five milligram vial there, that's only two dosages. Those run about 77 to $100 online in the research websites. It's a lot, it's not cheap. And you're gonna inject once a week on average. And I say on average because if you microdose, you can do something what we call split dosing, where you could take, instead of 2.5 milligrams once a week, you could take 1.25 and split it in half twice a week. Less impact on the gut, longer duration, because if you inject once, now you got the whole week for that to titrate out. But if you inject twice, now you've got, when it starts to dip down a little bit, now you've got another little coming in. I do this a lot with testosterone injections. Um, a lot of different things in terms of the peptide space I do this with. But but in particular, testosterone injections can be titrated this way or, or microdosed or split-dosed, if you will. Split-dosed is the most common term, though. Hey, Hell Junkies. Wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas. Two, this day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do 
if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happyholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not gonna remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I only, I really just wanna lose like 10 pounds. I just need a little leg up. Well, because terzepatide has been found to help with microbiome and help with blood sugar, so insulin resistance, big thing for us ladies over 40, and you're sick of like (laughs) apple cider vinegar and all that stuff as being a thing to try to help you, this might be an option. I absolutely love the idea of injections over trying to put so many things oral down, down the hatch. Same thing goes with apple cider vinegar. I mean, it's hard on your teeth. Now, it's helpful, and a lot of people tout apple cider vinegar to be as good as semaglutide and and terzepatide, and I've probably said it because it does work after meals to help with blood sugar balance. But here's the thing. You can only, I don't know about you, unless you really like vinegar, you can only do that for so long. Your enamel on your teeth can only handle it for so long. And if you use a straw, or you use a straw too much, you're going to get smoker's wrinkles around your lips. You don't want that. Or you could use a little bit more estradiol or estriol cream on your face and try to ward that off. By the way, another little hack. Same cream you're putting vaginally, you can also transfer it up to your face. Compounded pharmacies only, though, because if you're using the conventional creams, they have parabens in them. Parabens are linked to cancer. So why would you put a paraben cream in a vaginal cream that's supposed to help support a woman and her hormones? I don't understand. And then now they're saying hormone bioidenticals are not related to cancer, but then are we going to come out and be like, oh, yeah, they are, and then blame it on the hormones, but when it was really the freaking parabens that you put in the cream? Killing me. Killing me here. Same thing goes with the, the I'm Vexi or whatever the name of the, yeah, it's I'm Vexi suppositories for helping with vaginal dryness. They have titanium dioxide and phthalates. Phthalates are linked to cancer. It's like a forever chemical. What the? Oh, kill me now. So anyway, if, if you're wanting to save money and use pharmaceutical versions for your bioidentical replacement, that's on you, but you've been warned. You've been warned. And that's why I will tell people over and over again, there's something up with that. That's all I can say. There's something up with that. And that's why I love compounding pharmacies because you can get non-toxic products to help you. Seriously important. And where we are at this day and age, I'm going to step on a soapbox for a second. Where we are at in this day and age, you want to support your compounding pharmacists. They are independent. They're working on their own. And... There's a lot of stuff happening right now with trying to get rid of compounding. Please help save it because it's what helps us from having toxic things. Or we're going underground. There's that too. So back to uh, researched peptides that you're researching on your own when you go to the websites. So a lot of for for a lot of my my career, I have I'll be honest, I, I've steered away from recommending the underground peptides unless I knew that someone was comfortable purchasing something online like that. Because let's face it, I don't know the owners of these companies. And they're really hard to nail down because, well, it, they're living on the fringe. And I don't blame them for that. And there are three companies that I really think do a good job and if you want to know what they are, I recommend you email me at info at doctor spelled out J K R A U S E N D dot com. We'll get you those because I'm going to keep it chill on the podcast without shouting out stuff. Now, here's the thing you are in charge of your health. If you think, like, hey, I really need a leg up on getting some weight down and you're doing all the things, 
like, am I a fan of like, hey, let's do this because it's a quick, easy result and I'm you're just going to keep eating junk food and doing, you know, not working out. Yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not going to it's not going to be sustainable. You're going to gain the weight back. But if you're doing all the things and you're not getting the results, peptides can be super helpful. And at this point in my practice, I've seen a lot of folks finally start dropping weight that were struggling for years. And I'm happy that they're getting results and I'm ha and, and they're happy, right? It's it's important. So if you're thinking about this and you're like, "Man, I don't know." but you're doing all the things, save yourself some frustration and try out a peptide. Try it out, see what happens. Worst case scenario, if things slow down, you get kind of sick, all right, great, you're gonna recover, it's not permanent. The only case in which the GLP-1, so these are the semaglutides and the terzepatides, the only case in which I do not recommend them is if you've had thyroid cancer, you currently have thyroid cancer, you have a family history of thyroid cancer, you wanna be careful, like that's very, very like known data. Otherwise, if you don't have any history of any of, of that, then okay, try it. See what's going on, see what happens. You want to save yourself frustration. It may actually help your nervous system in the long run. So much food noise is a problem for women right? Food noise, but also frustration from not losing weight, hating, starting to hate food, starting to hate the whole concept of dieting, whatever. If it's causing that much grief in your life, you may want to start considering the peptides. Same thing goes for nagging aches and pains. If like your curcumin isn't doing it, you know, your turmeric's not doing it, it may be worth it to consider some BPC-157 and a little bit of TB500. Mix them together. They come together actually in a combined vial. So you could do that as well. If you're not so into the peptides for, you know, the GLP-1 peptides for weight loss, you could do AOD64 and you could pair it with something called MOTC. What is MOTC? It sounds like MOTC applesauce. <laughs> it's a peptide that helps the adrenal glands. And I've used it for when people are super depleted. It's a great peptide in that case. And I really like it for helping folks to really, let's say, reboot themselves. And I usually will pair it with thymus and beta-4. And the two of them together can, can be a good, what we call stack. When you, when you mix things together, they're called stacks. I wouldn't stack more than four things together. But this one... Um, is, is a good one. And it's, it's one injection a week on this. And it's a little bit heftier of injection in terms of dosage. Usually you're going to inject it into your abdomen. I guess I probably didn't mention that for the terzepatides and the semaglutides. Injection into the abdomen, into the subcutaneous tissue is the easiest way to go about it. Now, if we're talking about TB500 and BPC157 for helping with the tendons and ligaments and muscles, I recommend going right to where it hurts and going right over it. And if you have someone in your life, like an, a doctor who's been trained in injection therapy, or even an acupuncturist in Washington, they've been trained in injection therapy, consider an intramuscular injection into the area that hurts. It can be a game changer in that case and have us, you know, someone, one of us do it versus you doing that. Subcutaneous, you guys can handle it, but intramuscular, you gotta have some, a little skill there because we don't want you getting a vein or artery on that side of things. Now, can you combine these with vitamin injections? Yes, you can. Do I put them in the same vial? No, I want, or I'm sorry, in the same syringe? No, I'll separate the syringes on those because I don't know 100% if the two things together do okay. I have seen a combination of terzepatide and cyanocobalamin, which is B12, but it's, it's cyan, no not the best B12 to be injecting into yourself. You want methyl B12, or if you are sensitive to methylated Bs, you want to look for adenosyl and hydroxy B12 injections and keep them separate. I, th I think it's better to keep those ones separate, but peptides you could totally combine. There's no issue of stacking them together in the same syringe.
Now you're using an insulin syringe because when we're talking about injections, I mean, we're talking about minute amounts of fluid until you get to the higher dosages on the semaglutides and ter terzepatides. But like for BPC-157 and TB-500, tiny, tiny dosages. Same thing with the CJC and the ipamorelin. Now, perhaps you've heard of samorolin, and so anything with lin on the end of it, those are your growth hormone boosters. Now, you may have heard of GnRH6 or GnRH2. These are other growth hormone boosters as well. So there's a variety of things out there. If you go to a peptide website, you may be like, holy cow, I had no idea there was this much stuff out there. And yeah. It's, it's cool how much is out there. And just reading through all of the different functions is like, wow, I had no idea. So those are the most common peptides that I am using in my office. Now, there are others. There's one called Epitalon or Epitalin. It's, the, it's tomato, tomato on that one. But it's considered to be a longevity peptide and cycled a couple times a year. 20-day cycle, you could consider something like that too. It's it's fascinating all the different things out there. There's something called dihexa for anxiety. There's, there's oh my gosh, I'm like thinking, Sarah, thinking in my head, like there's so many different things, but honestly, I've given you the ones that I most commonly use. And, you know, if there's something else you're looking for, oh, oh my gosh, I didn't even talk about my brain one. Cerebrolysin, this is an amazing one for helping with brain function. And I like this one more, sub not subcutaneous, but intramuscular. And doing this one, like say you really need to have like an on point brain day. This one is amazing to just pop into the shoulder and like let the brain flow. It does wear off. Cerebrolysin is something that you'd have to take regularly to keep the brain flowing. I've microdosed it, but I found that the microdoses aren't as powerful as the full dose on it. They come in little vials. You break the vial, you draw it up, and you inject. Um, it's cool. It's really cool. There's also ones like Selnec, which is like a nasal spray that's supposed to help with the nose too. These are different things, not with the nose, down with the brain as well. Clearly, I need to inject myself with cerebrolysin right now. Um, but selenic, selenic, also tomato, tomato, selenc, selenc, I don't know. Um, I probably need to go to like a formal class beyond weightlifting and experimenting on yourself um, school. But here's the thing. I've gone to some of the peptide classes and I feel like I know a lot more than the people there because I've just experimented a lot with other weightlifters and other folks that have been in the gym with me. And so <laughs> gym talk is where I've learned the most. And whether that scares you or whether that intrigues you, I don't know. But I have to admit that when you're looking at new things that are, quote, new, because these have been around since the 80s, things that are new to the, the, the scene in the U.S., we do want to always think about things that are standardized to be safe. And of course, if I'm working with someone, I'm going to be safe in terms of the dosing. Now, once I have established how something's going, I, I will adjust if we need to. And of course, I'm an N of one. I will try anything on myself within reason just to see what happens. And so I... I think there's a lot of great merit for cerebrolysin as long as we can keep it around because I've heard that there's been shortages there too. And the nasal sprays too will go in and out of being around and then not, but they can be incredibly helpful for a little brain boost. Now they've been used also in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative patients too and helpful. But the thing is, like I said, it does have to be a daily dose. This isn't one that's going to be like once a week. It's not going to carry through the week. It's going to just go through the day. And I don't recommend cerebralizing for someone that's actively feeling quite anxious because it does amp you up. It gets you going. Another little side note, BPC-157 can also give you energy and get you going. So something you want to do during the day, don't take it at night because I've had a lot of people tell me, I can't sleep after I inject the BPC. And I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah, it helps with energy. So little tidbits there. But 
just to sum up on peptides, really, they are super helpful. And yes, there's hype. Yes, there's side effects. You do want to talk with someone qualified to know how these things work. And someone who's been doing it for a little while versus jumping on the bandwagon trend and just learning in the last couple of weeks or months. Not to be trite, but you, you do want to know what you're doing here because it is different. And like I said, not all of them are, cons are on the mainstream. They are considered research-based. And if you're up for finding something different, finding solutions for you, peptides are worth a look. Contact someone like myself or someone who is educated. There is an international peptide society, uh, and there's a lot of docs that are, are looking at the research that are using peptides in their office. Great stuff there. There is also, a, I believe, a membership that you can get to look at a lot of the research on the International Peptide Society's website. And there are other. There's American Peptide Society, I believe, as well. So there are resources out there to learn more. I will put them in my notes at drjkrausnd.com. Peptides are fascinating. Don't let the hype turn you off. Take a look at them a little deeper and consider the fact if you're getting frustrated, you're taking a lot of supplements, nothing's working, you're doing all the things, peptides might be the next step to try out on yourself and create a, a relationship with them so that perhaps they could be one of your aging support protocols, which is where I really truly see peptides being incredibly helpful moving forward since we make them ourselves. None of these things are made up in terms of molecules. They are synthetic based off of human-made proteins. So cool stuff. I think it's worth a, a look. And um, apologize to a lot of folks for not saying something sooner. I just figure at this point, since it looks like they're going to be staying around and maybe we're not going to be pulling them, hopefully not, crossing your fingers, worth a look. All right, you've survived another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus. You have a great day, whatever you're doing. And if you like this podcast, please share this with your friends. Give us a rating. Let me know how I'm doing and just support the mission. I'm really trying to get out true information that I see in my practice. A lot of folks are spewing out information that they've seen with research. I'm working on people. I'm working on myself. I can give you what's going on from the street. So have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.